would you feel like if you had an appointment with God at 9 a.m. tomorrow? Would you be able to eat the rest of the day? Would you be able to sleep tonight? You've got an appointment with God tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. He's given you instructions. He's told you where to meet him and what to bring. <clears throat> well, that was the case with Moses. Come up in the morning to Mount Sinai, God said, and present yourself there to me on the top of the mountain. Moses was to bring two stones like the ones on which God had written his commandments before. You remember that previously Moses came down from the mountain and discovered the people's idolatry in building and worshiping the golden calf. His anger burned hot. That's how the Bible puts it. His anger burned hot and he threw the tablets of the Ten Commandments on the ground and they broke. Now God is going to give Moses his commandments on the tablets of stone again. He's going to meet Moses on the mountaintop. Now to really understand the full impact of this story, let's review what led up to this meeting on the mountain. God called Moses and gave him the responsibility of leading the people out of Egyptian bondage. When God confronted Moses with this call, telling Moses what he had in mind, Moses did what most of us do when we take a telephone message. We ask, who shall we say is calling? Moses asked God for a name. God responded, I am who I am. Another translation would be, I will be what I will be. This name for God points to his self-existence and eternality. He is saying, I am the one who is, I am the one who will be. This answer, I am who I am, has always seemed a little cryptic to me. But I'm told that to those ancient Israelites, it would have been understood. The significance is in its relation to God of our fathers and would have been immediately discerned by the Israelites. He is the same God throughout the ages. This meant that who God was would be defined by his keeping the covenant that he had made with Abraham and by extension his deliverance of the people out of captivity and is leading them into the promised land, it was on the basis of that promise that Moses took the job. I'm going to stray slightly from the subject because this leads me to another confusing Jewish name for God, the name that we call Yahweh. That was considered so sacred that it should not be pronounced. It was therefore written in the Hebrew consonants YHWH. Thousands of years later, Jewish scholars inserted the vowels from the divine name Adonai, which means master or lord. So they inserted that word Adonai into YHWH and made the unpronounceable name a hybrid which could be pronounced. Yehovah, Yehovah. When reading, you would, you would see the, the letters and distinguish them as the sacred name of God, but you could read them, and this gave rise to the name Jehovah, when translated into English. Now back to the subject. At Sinai, people felt, uh, fell into idolatry 
before a golden calf set up by Aaron. God became angry, so angry, he said to Moses, Let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them and that I may consume them. Then comes one of the most revealing episodes in Moses' life. Moses reveals his own true character. Moses says, lays his life on the line for the people whom God has called him to serve. Moses knows that the people have sinned. He knows they are stiff-necked, as God put it. Yet he also knows a bit about God. And he pleads with God. He pleads by offering his whole life. Listen to him. Forgive their sins. If not, blot me. I pray thee, blot me out of thy book. What a commitment. What leadership. What a revelation of Moses' commitment. Moses not only asked that God pardon their sin... He pleads that if someone must be punished for the sins of the people, lay the penalty of the sins on him. Sound familiar? Of course it does. That's a foretelling of Jesus on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But then Moses goes even further. He becomes even bolder. He presses to the limit when he says, Now show me your glory. And that brings us to where we started. God says, All right, how about tomorrow morning? Let's uh, look at the verses 19 through 23. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But, he said, You cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, There is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. So here we are, where we began. Suppose you had an appointment with God tomorrow morning. What would you feel like? I know I couldn't sleep if I had a date with God tomorrow morning. If God had promised to tell me something that he'd never told anyone else. I'd be wide-eyed all night long. No wonder the scripture says that Moses rose up early in the morning and went up to Mount Sinai. This was to be the day of days. He was going to get a glimpse of God, even though it was only his back. What Moses saw on the mountain is important. He saw a cloud. And remember, whenever there is a cloud in the Old Testament, open your eyes wide because God is close by. While Moses is standing in the crevice of the rock, the Lord passes by and Moses sees him, sees him in the sense of sensing his presence. But what Moses sees is not nearly as important as what he hears. Because as the Lord passes by, he says to Moses, this is in chapter 34, verses 6 and 7, the Lord says, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Moses' glimpse of God became an answer to the question of ages. Who is God? What is God like? 
Now, what is so remarkable about this is that way back there, near the dawn of religious history, becomes, comes a word about the essence of who God is and what God is like. As time went on and as the face of God was unveiled in the person of Jesus Christ, the meaning of those words continued to stand out. The Lord, the God, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. If we boil that down to its essence, what we have is what theologians write volumes about. God is holy love. God is perfect goodness. That is the foundational truth on which we build our faith and on which you can rest your life. God is holy love and perfect goodness. His purpose is to produce that goodness in you and me. That means he must take sides against sin, against all badness, against all evil. There's an old story about President Coolidge, which tells about his coming home from church one day and being asked by his wife what the preacher talked about. Sin, he said. Well, what did he say about it? He was against it. And so is God. He cannot help being against it because he is for the opposite, righteousness and holiness. In the light of that fact, then, we're ready to look at those tough words God spoke to Moses in verse 7. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. What he's saying is because he is holiness itself, he can never put up with anything that is unholy. That means you cannot break the law of God even to save your life. You're a fool if you try it. One day, Nancy Pelosi was standing in the rotunda of the Capitol and something fell and struck her on the head. Chuck Schumer saw what had happened and rushed up to ask what he could do to help. Speaker Pelosi said, go into the Senate chamber and have the law of gravity repealed. The point here is a good one. Only a dunce would try to beat the law of God. Now I'm not saying that that story is true. I may have dreamed it. Thankfully, alongside the holiness of God is the love of God. A woman, a woman went to a photographer to have her picture taken. She took her seat in the studio and fixed her pose. While the photographer was adjusting his lights, she said to him, Now be sure to do me justice. He replied, My dear, what you need is not justice but mercy. Doesn't take long for us as we look at our life to realize that what we need is not justice but mercy. And our text tells us that what we need is ours. It's ours because the Lord, the Lord God is merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. We know that our Heavenly Father will not clear the guilty. There is accountability. When your child puts his finger into the fire, it will be burned. No matter how much you love him, you cannot banish the burn. But you can forgive him. You can tell him that even though he disobeyed you by playing with fire, now that he is sorry for his disobedience, you will forgive him and not hold it against him anymore. In the same way, while God is forced to visit our iniquity, 
on us because of his holiness. He is still merciful and gracious and forgiving. Moses knew that. And you and I need to remember it. Amen.